Welcome to Author Talk on CBSNews.com. We are joined today by Jeffrey Gray, author of Skyjack, uh, a book about the, uh, the fascinating case of D.B. Cooper, or Dan Cooper, uh, the man who uh, hijacked a plane 40 years ago, a case that remains unsolved. The only unsolved hijacking in history, in U.S. history? In the world. In the, in the world, there you go. Um, who also, by the way, you lucked into a bit of news recently, you may have seen, um, when it was announced that the FBI may have a major break in the D.B. Cooper case. Let's talk about that first. Did they have a break? Well, I mean, this is like one of these experiences you just, you just can't make up. Here it is, like a week before the book is published. I spent four years <laughs> investigating this case and not coming to any conclusion as to who the hijacker is. It's not really what my book's about. And I'm trying to think, like, all right, who am I going to invite to the book party? You know, thinking about these, these things. And I read on the Internet, Cooper case about to be solved. And literally what happened is, is that uh, this, this sort of this cavalcade of accidents and events where one particular lead that the FBI thought had merit trickled, ca you know, cascaded, avalanched into this media storm mm -hmm. during the slowest news week of the year. So it got overcovered. Yeah, in a, in, a, in a way it got overcovered. And, um, but also what was unique about the event is that despite the, the problems with the new evidence proffered, the story really resonated with the country. And I think that's the phenomenon that was most interesting to me is that why is it that we were willing to engage with this kind of story at that time. And one, I, one of the things that I, I began to piece together, you know, before the, uh, when this, all this stuff happened, is that it really felt like the country now is in a very similar moment to where we were in 1971. You know, Mark Twain had this great saying, he said, you know, history never repeats itself, mm -hmm. it only rhymes. And so you have all these same different things going on now as they did in 1971, which is where the legend was born. Bad economy, frustration, paranoia over technology, really an atmosphere where somebody who commits an act of individualism can be celebrated. Whether it's crazy individualism or not, or illegal individualism or not. Right. That's interesting. Um, do, do you get the sense that people who uh, were, were fascinated by the case th this time around again in the past couple weeks were brand new to it and had never heard of it before, or they, or they followed it back then? Yeah. I mean, I think that there, there's a lot of new D.B. Cooper fans out there, and people like I did had no idea about this case. This was, for the most part, a, a regional, provincial, Pacific North, Northwest thing. And uh, now everybody knows about it and everyone's fascinated about it. And um, I think it, it was like this, re you know, as we approach the 40th anniversary of the hijacking this fall, it's like a, a new introduction to it for sure. The, 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 the new lead, though, did turn out to be essentially that's not mm -hmm. D.B. Cooper. You know, the new lead um, about um, a woman's uncle, Uncle mm -hmm. Lynn Doyle Cooper, Uncle L.D., uh, was uh, vanilla ice cream in, in the D.B. Cooper world. It was a lead, like many others, um, based on a memory that uh, was somewhat old. And um, was just, you know, if you had the, the luxury of sp spending three years on the case and reading, you know, the details of the more than 1,000 suspects and persons of interest, it would be a lead that would feel very familiar. Um, but the way in which it was presented and the seriousness with which the FBI took it um, really sort of avalanched it or, 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 or skyrocketed yeah, it. Yeah, it was, it, was, it was all over the place. Speaking of the FBI, you were, as far as we know, the first journalist to gain access to some of these files that dealt with the case. Um, what, what surprised you most about those files? Well, what surprised me most about the files Okay, well, once I started wading into this treasure, really, was not only the details of the hijacking, which I was able to recreate really minute by minute in the book, but all the other Uncle L.D. Coopers in there. You know, all uh, the file itself is mostly filled with our own paranoia. Letters written from neighbors, ex-lovers, fathers, suspecting everybody of being the hijacker. And to me, reading these, you know, these accounts of, of how you could expect, you know, you could suspect that your loved one could have pulled off this crazy mm -hmm. job, to me was a phenomenon worth exploring. And, th and that's part of what, th that's, a, that's a large approach of the book, is you looked into why all these people did this. N obviously not all of them are right. None of them may be right about right. their uncle or relative, but there was this searching, if people feel 
people devote their lives to trying to figure out whether their relative was D.B. Cooper. Right, right. It's, it's, a, it's a true phenomenon where, you know, in our country we have a tendency to, to, to celebrate criminals in a lot of ways when you think of the Sopranos or when you think of, you know, our, you know, our obsession with wise guys and, and different things. But Cooper himself was a transcendentalist in a lot of ways. He was able to make the good guys root for the bad guys. You know, even the law enforcement people that were looking for him in the woods wanted him to escape. And people want to share in that coup. People want to share in that story and um, are looking out, looking for him right now. He was also this mythical macho figure, you know, smoking a cigarette on a plane, or at the time when cigarettes were being smoked on right. planes, drinking a scotch. Right, I and mean, one of the things I found <laughs> was, was so interesting about this story is that the myth of Cooper, of D.B. Cooper, and the true story of Dan Cooper are two totally different tales, and they are probably are the opposite of each other. One of the things about hijackers I found reading psychologist reports of them was that hijackers themselves were actually very generally effeminate. A lot of them were latent homosexuals, and um, believe it or not, and so the my belief that the hijacker himself was nothing like the myth. You know, we had this idea of this uh, sort of demo debonair guy in a suit and tie uh -huh. smoking butts, uh -huh. but his tie was a clip-on from J.C. Penney's. His suit, I don't even think matched his pants. It was uh, what I believe to be maroon colored or russet even. Huh. And uh, he was a schlub. He was a schlub, but he was, he was at least slightly sophisticated. I mean, he knew a little bit about what he was doing, right? He, right. he was smooth. Right, he was, he was very talented in his ability to, um, to work under extreme pressure. You know, one of the things that I found in the files is just these details of him dealing with these parachutes on this flight, mm -hmm. flying over the great forest of the Pacific Northwest with the stairs down in a rainstorm, tying uh, this mo money bag to himself, and he had a pocket knife. He, you know, he thought everything out for the most part. So while schlubby, he did possess a certain body of knowledge probably yeah. obtained in the military. He got away with how much money? 200000 okay. in $20 bills. $200,000 all in $20 bills. There's no dispute about the fact at, at this point that he did jump from the plane in a parachute. It's just a question of what happened then. It's a question of where and what happened. And nobody knows. And every time you try to figure out where and what happened, yet another mystery pops up. The biggest clue was the some of the money, the kind of burnt or burned up or at least uh, messed up money yeah. that was found several and years later. There, in general, there are two major clues to this thing. One was five thousand eight hundred dollars found buried in some sand on a riverbed, um, a river bank between Washington and Oregon. And the mystery of that find is that it was in a completely different location from where the, the plane flew. So how did the money get there? The other clue discovered recently is the name the hijacker used, Dan Cooper. You know, for years the FBI thought Dan Cooper was like this Main Street name, like this Mike Smith. They couldn't figure out what it meant. But now we know, through some sleuthing, that Dan Cooper actually was significant. The name was very important. And who Dan Cooper was was... Why? Why is the name so important? Well, Dan Cooper was a French comic book character who flew airplanes really fast and jumped out of them in parachutes. And when you read in these, this French comic, which has never been translated into English, you see this macho, rugged guy, this yeah. sort of Canadian... Royal Canadian Air Force G.I. Joe, and uh, it really makes sense that the hijacker would use this alias. Furthermore, a lot of evidence that I discovered in the files points to um, the possibility that uh, the hijacker could have Canadian roots or be Canadian. Did he survive the jump? Evidence looks that way. The evidence looks that way. It's not conclusive. But, uh, you know, I worked a lot with uh, forensic scientists who analyzed the money under, like, major, major microscopes. And from what they were able to uncover, they believed that the hijacker did survive the jump. But then we don't know where he went after that. Nobody knows. Does the case ever get solved, in your opinion? The only way that this case can be solved is through the extraordinary. You know, I don't know what that extraordinary is or could be. Could it be more money found? Could it be someone else coming forward with something? It needs to be something physical that we hadn't explored before because the problem in the case 
is that the physical evidence that the FBI has in its possession is not good enough to match against. So what I mean by that is that they have lots of fingerprints found in an in-flight magazine, but all of them are partial and none of them may be the hijackers. They have partial DNA strains found on his tie, but none of them are good enough to ascertain the hijacker's real genetic identity. And the key piece of evidence that, in my opinion, could be used to actually close the case for good, could actually be used to extract a, a full genetic code, are the eight Raleigh filter tip cigarette butts mm. the hijacker smoked and put it in the ashtray of row 18 on the flight. And the FBI has had these cigarette butts and they analyzed them in 1971 according to the files. But the cigarette butts are now missing and nobody knows where they are. Look at this mystery now. And uh, so <laughs> were they stolen from the evidence room by somebody on the inside or were they completely lost? Who knows? But we need these cigarette butts or else this case could go cold for a very long time. Yeah, something tells me the, uh, the, the, the fascination isn't going to go away. All right, Jeffrey Gray, author of, uh, author of Skyjack. It's a, it's a fascinating read if you get a chance. You've been watching Author Talk on CBSNews.com.